if I don't create the best thing that I could possibly create, it's over. My life is over, this career is over. All I am is this. I'm a creator, I'm an artist. I don't got nothing else going. This is what I do. If I don't put my heart and soul into what I'm doing in this studio right now, then I won't eat. You know what I'm saying? And my life has to change based on the quality of what this is. What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And today we have a very special guest, an artist by the name of Lawrence Matthews. What's up, Lawrence? What's up, man? What's up, what's up, what's up? How's it going? Hey, it's going great, man. Glad to have you. Appreciate you on the platform, man. I think this conversation today is going to be valuable um, for the artists and also your future fans, man, the ones you have already and the ones you're definitely about to gain with the music that I've heard. Let's let's start let's start here though, right? You are you're a new artist, like super new artist, yet at the same time you aren't a new artist because you're rebranding. You're in the middle of a rebrand. Can can you talk about where you were before and why you're rebranding under your 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 you know your government right now, Lawrence Matthew. Yeah. Like <laughs> what brings that about? So, um, so yeah, first and foremost, thank y'all for having me on here, whatever. I appreciate it. Uh, and so I would, I would say, so I, for maybe 10 years since I got out of high school, I was like making music under the name, uh, Don Lifted for a while. And it was more this kind of alternative hip hop kind of based thing. It was kind of based on a lot of the experiences I was having at the time and like the music I was making. And like, I started that in Memphis and kind of built my career up doing that and also fine art and filmmaking. So like I had a whole career, you know, existing as that artist and kind of like worked my way up for like literally like 10 years, you know what I mean? Like being a man where I was from and the scene that I was from and like having a lot of different firsts that had never happened and like went through that whole, everything that you always hear, you know, is artists that you're trying to kind of like bring into fruition. I kind of got there. And so when I finally got there, I ended up, you know, funding my own tour uh, and going on tour and then ended up getting signed uh to a regional kind of uh record label um and like for me at that time I was like yo my whole life is changing like all of these beautiful things are finna come I finally have a shot I've been working for years and years and years to get my foot in the door to be able to like do this and I finally got my foot in the door and it's not to say that it wasn't like what I thought it would be but at the same time it was like one of those things where you just kind of lose control like I had been independent and kind of running my own shit for years and so you kind of relinquish a lot of control. You don't really know as much. You know, it's your first go at it. You're from a place, like I'm from Memphis. So you're from a place where there's not a lot of industry. You know, Memphis has a lot of music history, but we don't have a lot of infrastructure. So you don't really learn the things that you need to learn. And a lot of times when you sign paperwork and you're doing these different things, it's definitely based in a, a, a space of desperation. And so for me, it was definitely that. It wasn't necessarily like I was desperate, 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 but it was like, yo, if I don't do this, I maybe will not have a shot. It took me 10 years to get to this place, to have one person want to do something with me. You know what I mean? So you end up, you know, signing paperwork and, and I end up putting out a record uh, with that label uh, and it was cool. And then they didn't pick up the option. And so, and also even within that, I had kind of realized that maybe I didn't want to be signed to a label and it, it wasn't the way that I wanted to run my career. I'm very hands-on with everything. Like I produce my own stuff. I write my own stuff and record my own stuff, like make all my own content, direct my videos, write my videos, edit my videos. Like that's who I was. That's who I was. And so to be in this space where like, I didn't really have much control, uh, was very hard for me. Um, and so after that, you know, it kind of just got me to this space where like I had created something and worked on something for 10 years that kind of was bringing me unhappiness, to be honest with you. Like it just wasn't what I thought it would be. You know what I mean? And I realized how much it pulls from you and how much it takes from you and how much this game is what it is to where I was like, I want to do this my own way. Like I want to start this all over. And there's a lot of other factors in there, a lot of emotional things, a lot of like interpersonal things wrapped into that or whatever and what those experiences were. And, you know, we could talk about that more in detail, but I eventually got to the space where I was just like looking in the mirror and not really recognizing myself, not really understanding how I found myself here and like how I had lost control of something that I had built, you know, for years and years. 
And so I was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to tear it apart. And so once that option thing happened, I like me and my management parted ways that I had at the time. I fired my booking and I went all the way back to like square one and like was like, yo, I'm I'm just going to make music as Lawrence Matthews with no limits, no bounds, no, no boundaries on what I'm trying to do creatively. Nobody in my ear telling me what to do, trying to force me to change what I'm trying to do. And I'm just going to be me in ways that I ain't never been me since I was maybe a little kid. You know what I mean? When you think about trying to reconnect with your inner child and these things, like I was like, I'm just going to do that. And so I started making music from that place. And so the album that, you know, we're, we're going to share with the world, you know, in the near future came from all of that and like pulls from all of those experiences and a lot of the darker stuff that, you know, I experienced along the journey to free myself, you know what I mean? From, you know, business things, from interpersonal things, from my environment and where I'm from. Cause again, I'm from Memphis. So it's a certain type of energy, you know what I mean? And so that was kind of where I ended up starting to get to that transition. And of course there's more details and we can get into that, you know, whenever, but that's kind of the initial thing. So, man, yeah. Man, you, you said a mouthful, man. You got me thinking about so many different things. Uh, I think the first place I want to just start, though, is hold up, hold up. You, you're telling me, just say Limelight Honey, for instance, your track that just dropped fe on February 26th. You produced that, obviously performed, uh, you know, as the artist wrote it and everything like that. But you're tell me, telling me the music video for it as well yeah. like you directed me and my brother it. me and my brother shot that and directed that and edited that together like a lot of stuff is in-house we ain't really got no choice like i learned to record and engineer also that song we recorded it in my dining room in my crib so like the album was made in my dining room because again like we went i mean that's what i was always doing anyway like when we talk about you know artists and these different dynamics like when i got my first advance i didn't spend it on nothing but buying studio equipment because I knew that at some point these people could probably take this from me. And if I go to their studios or I get connected to their people, then I'm relying on them to make music. And I never like being reliant. Like I don't like relying on nobody to, sure. make, to be able to make music. I so I just I bought a bunch of stuff. Let me stop you. Let me stop you. I appreciate everything you're saying, but why it's important that you did all that stuff is yeah. because your shit is hard, bro. Like, not gonna lie, <laughs> like it's actually shocking to hear um, and see like the quality of the, the the video as well. Like, like all right, hearing dope music from artists, all right, you you want to hear that? That's entry, that's status quo. Then you hear dope music and he produced it. Like, oh okay, oh, that, that's that sounds special. But then when you see the visual on top of that, and you're selling saying that you directed it and like that's that's your thing, and put that together, like based on the whole package of everything that we're aware of, you know, like the vibes for, the, for the, your project coming up and everything. Hey, we, just to be real, we assumed you were signed, bro. Yeah, yeah we had a bet on it. You know yeah. obviously, we, <laughs> obviously we lost, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> but we did have a bet on it. I ain't got no deal, no paperwork, nothing. When we made that, I didn't have nothing. That was probably the worst time of my life when I made the album. I didn't have nothing, no management, no booking, nobody looking at me, no prospects, nothing. I was, I essentially had fucked my career off when I made that album, you know what I mean? And so the the the, the quality of what you're hearing is, is one, you're hearing a person who is free and can do anything that they want to do, so they're going to do it. The sampling, the, all that stuff, like, I didn't have no budget. There was no budget there. It was just make the best music you can make right now with the resources that you have. And so I just, we went into the studio and did that, and so... I had to shout out my homie C Major. He did my drum uh, programming because I didn't know how to use NPC at the time. But I would dictate what I wanted and we would come up with the things and he would play it for me. But I would like sit in there and really compose this music and be like, hey, we're using this sample this way. Chop it like this, da, 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 da. Like, OK, let's do whatever, whatever. But I want to shout him out because like I wouldn't he was my only partner in making this project. It was me and him in the studio every day for, I mean, from November, 2021 to like August, 2022. It was just me and him in the studio, in my dining room, which is the studio, but we was just in there working on this project. Um, and then also when I say you hear the, the person who's, you know, free, you also hear a person is like, yo, if I don't create the best thing that I could possibly create, it's over. 
my life is over, this career is over. All I am is this. I'm a creator. I'm an artist. I don't got nothing else going. This is what I do. If I don't put my heart and soul into what I'm doing in this studio right now, then I won't eat. You know what I'm saying? And my life has to change based on the quality of what this is. We made this album to free me. You see what I'm saying? To free me not only from previous business circumstances or whatever, but to free me from the life that I was in and am currently kind of in. I'm in the flux right now. Like, again, I'm in New York right now. It's like I wouldn't have been able to do that back then. You see what I'm saying? There was nobody there. This music has gotten me here. So the, the fact that I even have management at this point is because he heard a song that we put out just, just to put it out. You see what I'm saying? And so, yeah, like what you said, I ain't signed. I ain't got nothing. And, you know, we still building this ship. Like, we building this plane while it's flying. For real, for real. All we had was the music. I want to drop a quick note for anybody who has a fan problem and not just any old fan problem, but the type of fan problem that we encountered after helping a lot of artists go viral, have a lot of success, get a lot of streams, but still not being able to know who exactly are my fans? How do I reach them? How do I actually leverage that to sell merch, go to a show? Because that's where Spotify leaves us without knowing who our real people are. Same for social media. If you've had this problem, I'll tell you how we've been solving it at our agency for a while now. And the pro version is just now being released to be accessible to any artist or manager out there. I'm talking about Forever Fan. A lot of the campaigns and successes that y'all have heard us talk about on this channel have been powered by that software that's made finding and understanding your true fan simple so they support you with their pockets. Because we all need a little money in this music thing. And now they're making it available to our audience for only $1 at foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels, no labels with an S at the end. And you got to put in the code no, no labels zero two. All right. Now, look, the DSPs, the social media platforms, I think they've shown us how much they care about artists for a while now. So at this point, we can all play naive or actually do something about it. Bet on yourself at foreverfanmusic.com slash no labels. And again, put in the code no labels zero two to get initial access for only one dollar. Let's get back to this episode. Yeah, that's hard, man. I mean, it's, it's dope, man, because it's a it's a testament to some things we've kind of said where, like you said, like you're technically starting at ground zero in a sense of positioning. But because of mentality, you're not really at ground zero. Right. Like you're mm -hmm. you're, you're ahead of where the typical artists would be. Um, but you you said something earlier that that I wanted to ask you about. Well, I know I know you're from Memphis. Are you still like in Memphis? Like you're active actively out there living there and things like that. So yeah, so, I'm still back there. Yeah. Okay. So I, I know you had mentioned when you were under the other name, you said you were kind of making like alternative rap. You built a name for yourself in the local Memphis scene. Now you know you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've known about. The, the, the local Memphis scene based on who's come out the last couple of years, I, an alternative rapper being popular there just isn't something I would have, I would have kind of expected. So can you one talk about, you know, from your perspective, what the Memphis music scene is actually like? And then two, how were you, you know, you, this alternative rapper able to build a name for yourself in the city that's predominantly like trap and trap music oriented? So, so the city is interesting in that way. So a lot, a lot of it's perception, right? So like the people that, that see and look into the city, the only people who truly do make it out are trap and street artists, mm -hmm. right? Because there's different funding and there's different come-ups that they have to deal with that aren't maybe the traditional come-ups. Like you can break your record in the strip club, you can break your record in the clubs, you can break your record these different places. And, and then a lot of times when you do get some attention to be real with you, if you do get some attention in Memphis, you know, appealing to a certain element or whatever, certain people will come and snatch you up real quick. You know what I mean? We've seen it with Glorilla, like Gotti will come and get you. These people will come and get you and put you where you need to be. That doesn't exist in the scene that I came from. So for me, I built my kind of name in the gallery. So I went to art school um, and graduated like Dean's List, top of my class, like art star, all that kind of stuff. And had like a like an art career, like as a painter um, and a photographer. And I did public art too. And I still do public art from time to time. But I had a career as a visual artist and was like, you know, 
going back and forth between that and music. So when I started building my fan base, I tried to go some of those more traditional routes where I was performing at the clubs and the places and the little speakeasies and spots that like people kind of build their careers in, right? Specifically when you like into like the, the alt side, which is like through the poetry scene and stuff like that. And like, nobody was fucking with me. Nobody liked what I was doing. Nobody wanted to give me a shot. Nobody was fucking with me. So I said, all right, say less. I'm gonna go to the galleries. And so I found a spot uh, that allowed me to rent the space for like $60 a night. And so I started doing shows at this place and then hanging my art up and curating like site specific art installations that was connected to the music in this space. And it was one of a kind back then. Niggas do this all the time. Now, back then though, we talking 2013, 2014, 2012 and all up in that area of time. Like I started kind of doing that and first show 50 people, second show 100 people, third show 150 people to the point where we got it to the point where we couldn't do shows there no more. And then we started branching out and like partnering with like some of the larger museums and institutions uh, that are based in the city to do shows and to do partnerships and things. So I built my kind of fan base in the arts community, not in the necessarily like the the community community, you see what I'm saying? And so like Memphis is like 64% black and a lot of that honestly is impoverished or whatever. Um, and so you kind of, either have to speak to that or be present in that world. I didn't really grow up in that world per se. Uh, I didn't grow up wealthy or nothing like that at all. Like I grew up, you know, lower middle class or whatever, uh, out kind of on the outskirts of the city. But I would come into the city because of my art career. And I also was a filmmaker. I used to do, you know, documentaries about different neighborhoods and different issues that was taking place in the city. So I initially was like, famous in the, in where I come from as an artist and then started making music but I was always making music I've been making music since in high school but at a certain point the popularity in the music and the popularity of the art started kind of going like this and so I found myself in this intersection where I had a lot of white fans to be to be 100% with you like making the music that I was making before the audience was mostly white folks and alt people you know what I mean like alt people um, but maybe street folks weren't aware of me like that. But then at the same time, I would be like on the cover of all the local magazines and all like I would get all the press and all the articles because I existed in this intersection of fine art, film, music. Um, and of course, there's like this inherent like racism that's kind of built into that. Like you're the different nigga, you know what I mean? <laughs> so like there's some aspect yeah. of like being aware of that, you know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? Is that how they go? Because they yeah. want to reward you when you stand out from the bunch. And so that's a thing, to be real, especially where I come from. That's a big thing. But a lot of people who had ability to pr platform me uh, supported uh, the music. And then on top of that, I ended up like helping start a nonprofit that then opened the gallery space in like Orange Mound. And if you don't know nothing about Orange Mound, Orange Mound is like the oldest uh, Black neighborhood like original black neighborhood like slaves were able to get that land and then build their communities there so i started an art gallery there uh with some other people that i was dealing with at the time that i don't deal with no more but um i was able to like yeah i was like known like super known for all of these different things and depending on who you talk to they would know me for one thing or another uh but as the music kind of kept going and kind of kept going i got more and more known more and more successful but not in a mainstream kind of way it's very scene based in Memphis and Memphis is very territorial in terms of neighborhoods It's North Memphis, South Memphis, you got Orange Mound, you got Whitehaven, Binghampton, but then you got Midtown, Downtown, East Memphis, Germantown, Carryville, so on and so forth. So I was very popular in the like downtown, Midtown scene, but a lot of that environment, a lot of the people who are in that environment dictate a whole lot. And so when you think about you know, what you were saying about like what Memphis is kind of known for, like that that's a fact. Like I, if if it's me, would be the first non kind of street artist to emerge out of there. It's tons of us, though. It's not just me. The Memphis art scene is just as diverse as any other scene or the Memphis music scene is just as diverse as, as any scene as soul musicians, R&B musicians, rap musicians, of all different types, street folks, street like it's 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 
Chances and Kendricks and Kanye's and all these different types. It's those type of architect artists. There's the the super nineties retro kind of dudes. There's like the super. It's it's everything, but they just don't get no shot. You see what I'm saying? And nobody yeah. cares about them because there's a perception on the city that is projected onto us, and then we replicate it back to the world. You see what I'm saying? So we don't validate anything. We all sit there in the city and say, we want something different. We want something different. We want more. And it's not to say we're not taking away from the street narratives or the trap narratives or these different sounds, but there is more of the story that needs to be told that hasn't had an opportunity to be told. And a lot of times the people who do get to share end up uh, end up being producers. A lot of times they end up being producers because they can make those beats. They, you know, take Keith is Murfreesboro, but that sound is a Memphis sound. You know what I mean? And they are cut through my homie Cody. Cody produced for Scissor right now. Cody's his own artist, but he make music that sound different than what people would expect. And so when you do come up to people and you don't have a traditional Memphis sound, which I can argue with people about what that actually is, they kind of write you off. They should be like, oh, this is not. This is not that, you know what I mean? Uh, but when y'all hear the record, you know what I mean? And like even the the, the record that we just put out, I'm like, honey, that's Memphis stuff. That's that's Delta, you know, Delta blues samples, soul samples, all of these things. That's Memphis stuff. But most people who are outside the city recognize 3-6 Mafia is that. But there is that Stax sound. There is the music that comes before that. And that's the music that I tapped into to make this project um and so i know that's a long answer but like it is a very convoluted thing that we talk about all the time as memphians is like how do we add to this story how do we add to the narrative because the people who do know memphis know us for very specific things and it's yeah. not to say that those things don't matter or they don't exist but it's more to the story you know what i mean yeah. and i'm hoping that i can be one of the many people who then share that with with the world because i do think once that door break open you're going to see a thousand artists behind me, not even behind me, but alongside of me, who also have their unique Memphian story to tell. And it's going to change the way that people view the city. And it's going to open it up just like any other neighborhood, you know, in Chicago or L.A., like when, when Kendrick came through Compton, it changed the way that people saw Compton. It, it, it was a thing. And I feel like that's coming soon. It has to. Mm. Like, I'm working for that to be the case. Kendrick is a good example. I, I see exactly what you're saying, because I feel like a lot of scenes have that right you got something that gets popularized in your scene but then there's all these other artists that exist that feel constricted or can't get opportunities because people are looking for that like when i go to that particular place um and then kendrick as you said breaking out he definitely tapped into something different and helped people realize okay compton can look different feel different etc so you know in in where you lie musically versus the rest of the scene and what we heard, man, is, I mean, it's, it's definitely that. It's, it's different. If It's interesting. So it's not like the traditional Southern, because now trap feels Southern, right? Because that's been so popularized, right? But when you get into the blues aspect of things, and then if you think a little, and then you hear, you know, just your accent, of course, looking at your imagery, and then like, even if you think about a little bit of Dungeon Family type vibes, it feels like that's that feels like the energy that you that you tapping into mm -hmm. for sure i think you know i listen to i mean i always was a big fan of outcast like outcast is one of the first rap acts i ever heard in my life like when i was a kid my dad was playing that tupac and like a bunch of like older hip-hop like run dmc and like all that kind of stuff but like when i think back about like my first introductions to like rap music it was tupac and it was outcast you know what i mean and those early so outcast started. records and so for me, when I think of what Southern music sounds like to me, it sounds like when you listen to Outkast records, you hear the amalgamation of influences that come from the South. You hear the church, you hear the blues, you hear yeah. rock and roll, you hear all these things. These are essential elements. Every uh, uh, jazz, every single American music comes from that that pipeline, whether it's New Orleans to, to, to Mississippi, to Memphis, and then it goes up to Chicago, then it goes up to Harlem, then it goes out 
to South Central Los Angeles. You see what I'm saying? And so for me, what I want to do, and 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 then again, like for me, it, it mirrors my own personal journey of me tapping back into who Lawrence Matthews is. Let me take this genre that I love so much and tap back into it and take this region that I love so much and tap back into the originalness of this thing. So let me go and get these blues musicians and sample them and these like rock because it then comes into the rock like this old because it sounds like that but it's not really that it's still blues it's just like um electrified in different ways like especially for limelight honey uh that hoot your belly song that we sampled or whatever the way it sound is like we're, we're channeling that and pulling from that when you think about like and i know howlin wolf is not from i think he was from the south but then he moved but like howlin wolf like there's records where i'm like referencing him just as much as i'm referencing like ODB or just as much as I'm referencing Jay-Z or just as much as I'm referencing Andre or Goody Mob or UGK or any of these people like that album it is a southern album and I'm a southern artist and my narrative is that but the sonics of it is me pulling from everything that I love about hip-hop but you know building it on a uh, a, a palette or a foundation of our southern contributions to music you know what i mean yeah. uh and again like you said outcast is that for sure like people when i remember when i was younger folks like how oh, that is weird da, 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 da. i'm like this is, is uh, insane and when you go back and look at those videos look at how groundbreaking those videos are mm -hmm. to this day yeah the representation the way that they like pulling all of these different influences together there is nobody close None of us are going to get that. Like they had something special. We can only aspire to it. And for me, that was me. Like this album is very much like me trying to live in a tradition and like live up to the tradition of the amazing, amazing music that has come from Memphis, that has come from Atlanta, that has come from Houston, St. Louis, um, you know, I mean, even DC even like I throw DC in there because, you know, they, they, they right there too. So they, they, definitely, definitely. What's your favorite Outcast video while we on that? Oh, um, Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Okay. Rosa Parks is crazy. Bombs over Baghdad is also crazy. That's my number one right there. That's my number one. When you go back, it's crazy. Look at that video, and 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 not to like uh to, to carry it on, but like when you ask about that, right? There's a bunch of Outcast references in the Limelight Honey video. We were pulling specifically from like Players Ball and like um. What's that uh, first junk that they put out? Southern Playlistic, uh, like the like the single or whatever. When you go watch that video, there's shots where we were like paying homage to like shots from that video because when you go back and I and I wrote this in one of the statements that I sent out, we wanted something that felt naturalistic. You know what I mean? And when you go back before Outcast became like fantasy and it was like all of these things happening, if you go look at those early Goody Mob and Outcast videos, it's literally just them in their neighborhood. It's just them where they're coming from, representing these different places and the people in those spaces. When you go back and you look at Ludacris and T.I. early videos, not the T.I. where he was like trying to like be saucy or whatever, but like that when he kind of tapped into like, hey, I'm not ashamed to be a trap nigga. Here's the trap. You know what I mean? Like at first he was trying to do some different stuff. Uh, they had him Neptune beats and stuff. But like when you go back and you look at Ludacris, you look at like what's your fantasy video, and then you look at like uh, it's a few of them joints where like it's just him in Atlanta. And I was like, niggas ain't really did this in this way in a long time. Everything has been about like glitz and glam and all this stuff. And I was like, bro, I ain't got that. I ain't rich. I ain't signed. I ain't got nothing. What can we shoot? What do and then I was just like, oh, like let's just shoot what we do for real. Like the our family members, like everybody in that video is family, friends, loved ones, people, restaurants, and black businesses that I actually go to, actually hang out with, youth, uh, youth organizations that I actually work with. Like it's all actual connectivity in every single frame of that video, whether it be, you know, it's down on Bill Street, uh, which we had to represent that or whatever. But like everything is very tangible, real stuff. All the homies that was hooping, them are my homies. We hoop on the weekends. Like it was real Memphis life for us. You see what I'm saying? It ain't, you know, it ain't everybody life, but it's definitely ours. And that was something that I like saw when I looked at the early outcast, looked at the early Louis Chris, the early like even the Memphis stuff or whatever, like folks gangster walking and all that. It's like, this is 
that, like, let's do that. Let's not try to pretend that we got more going on than we got going on. We are here right now. And let's present here right now to the world because most people are here right now. You see what I'm saying? Most people don't have a G-Wagon. Most people don't have all of this rapper aesthetic stuff that works on social media. We don't, I, I don't have that. That's not my life. You know what I mean? But what can I do? What, what I can do is present my real life to you and where I am in this moment. Uh, whether that's in the lyrics, whether that's in the videos. And I'm going to keep doing that, you know what I mean? Just in my own way. Because um, that's what I, I believe in, like, just representing this place that don't get to be... It's always, like, the horror stories, you know what I mean? But it's, like, it's it's everything. It's, it's, a, it's a nuanced identity, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I love that, bro. I was literally just talking to an artist, like, last week, sometime last week. And he was from somewhere in the country of Georgia, from the same place as Phil Mob. And I was I was watching his video and I was like, all right, this is dope. But knowing where you from and then hearing the actual Sonics, his Sonics were you were representative. I was like, bro, you need to show more where you from. Like he he was trying to do like fancier videos, a little bit more fantasy. And I was just like, nah, man, show more. Because for somebody who's not in the country, like for a dude in New York. You know what I mean? Like, this looks like a whole nother world. You're showing them something that they can't see in, in, tangibly in their real life. In the same way you might be in the country watching somebody in New York and be like, yo, that feels like a different world. That looks crazy. Yeah. Like, show people that because that helps you stand out versus trying to feel like everybody else. And and that's what I got from watching you. It just, it definitely felt. I was like, man, he, he, you're doing exactly what uh, I was talking to that guy about doing. Yeah. Like, I, I could feel the energy. I felt like I knew more about you just from watching the visuals along with the music and everything. But like just watching the visuals, I, like, I feel like I know more about this place. You know, that's what we want. Cause I think it's like literally like my brother's in there. My aunt is in there. My grandfather is the pastor. That's Lawrence Matthew senior right there. Like these are my blood family relatives, loved ones, you know, my auntie who like exposed me to so much music growing up is in there with the cats and like giving me the guns and like all that stuff is like, that was my grandfather's guns who passed right before uh, he passed when we put out another record, Green Grove. But like, that was his shotguns and like all of that stuff. Like th this was my, like that was at my granny house. You know what I mean? Like a lot of that. And like, again, like what you said, I ain't got all of this other stuff. And even if I did have all of this stuff, some stuff is greater than you, you know what I mean, in terms of like what you're trying to do and what walls we trying to break down. And, and you know, like I was just talking to another artist from the city the other day and he was like, man, I'm trying to do this and do this. And, and like, and I'm like, yeah, bro, like we all need to be trying to do this. It's a concerted effort. You know what I mean? We ain't got to be buddies or whatever. But like, if you got the common goal of expanding this narrative and I also had this common goal alongside my individual goals it's going to change everything. Like people are already saying that Memphis is create, um, adding to this much of the market, this much of the this, this much of the that. So what, what happens when we have more than just that one narrative? What happens then? Like when we, when we look at Atlanta and we go, Atlanta's the, the Mecca, it's this, that, and the other. Well, Atlanta's had the shot. It's been able to represent everything. Atlanta got two chains, Outcast, Ti, also Young Thug, also it's like they can they can show so many facets of who they are as Atlanta people. Memphis has not given been allowed the chance to do that because our narrative keeps being spit back in our face that we just trap and we hood and we violence and we and yes we are those things, but we also are all the other people who live in and out of those things and in between those things and they got stories to tell too. And so for me it's real important to like be true. And that was another part of like, when we talk about the transition from, you know, my previous name to where I am now, I couldn't be as true in that music. It started as that, but then you're younger and then people start to place an expectation on what you should create and what you should be and how you should present and it's doing well. So you feel incentivized as a young person in your twenties to do that. And you keep regurgitating this stuff and just trying to make it the best you can. But at some point you go, do I want to be performing this? Do I want to win a Grammy for this? Do I want to be performing this for millions of people? Do I see myself performing this for millions of people? Do I want to keep even singing these songs? They're great songs, 
but I got so much more I want to say. There's so much more I want to show. And when we talk about fantasy, most of the music videos that I created at that time period were all based in fantasy. They take place in my head. And it's because my real life, I felt like wasn't worth showing, to be honest with you. And I didn't think nobody would care. You know what I mean? And at this point, again, you get to this place where you go, it's so important, or I'm, I'm being ripped at the seams so much so that I'm going to live and die with me. I'm just going to live and die being Lawrence Matthews, this artist. Whether people like me, love me, whether this works or it don't. And I say it in a song. I just might try this on my own just to see how far it gets. Just to see. Because I've never been able to fully be myself as an artist. You mess around, you name yourself something stupid when you're 19 years old or whatever it is. And then it takes off. And now you this. And now you sign paperwork as this. And all kind of other stuff. And so now you have to live out this thing. You have expectations of something that you not even are. You not even that no more. And when do you get to evolve? When do you get to share something new? And if you got paperwork on you, never, nigga, never. And I learned that in the visual art space. You make a great painting. They want you to keep making that painting. Make it forever and ever and ever. Because we get to brand you this way. We don't care that you evolve. We don't care that you want to do photos no more. We don't, we don't care what you want to do. We want to want you to do what makes us money. You see what I'm saying? And so for me, when I stepped away from all of that, I was really like, you know, some cliches, you're like choosing me at the end of the day and being like, I'm going to live and die as me. I'm going to share this art as me. Whether it fails or succeeds, my name is on it. It's me. So because of that, I'm going to pour my heart, my soul, everything I got, every resource every phone call I can make. And that's how I ended up even being back in this space again is by being like, this is me. It's connected to me. Not in a way of like, oh, this is just what I do. No, this is what I am. And so in that space, I got to call, email, get anybody I can to understand what I'm trying to do here to figure out how to fund it, to figure out how to share it with the world, to figure out how to, how to maximize it. And that's, it is what it is because because it's me. It's literally me. That album is me. The, the, the success and failure of that is the success in life or death of me as a person is directly connected because that's the, the deal that I made my, with myself when, when we went into the studio to make that. And we were like, yo, this got to save my life or I'm going to be out here fucked up. I'm going to be out here throwing boxes or living in a way that I don't want to live. Nigga, I tell you right now, I don't, uh -uh, I'll check out. I'm cool. That's not the life I want. I've done it before. You see what I'm saying? All my niggas do it. And not the rant, but all my niggas throw boxes. All my niggas work for Amazon and FedEx and this place and that place and that place. They're factory workers. That's all that get produced. You see what I'm saying? My skills are art-based. I don't got no other skills. You see what I'm saying? So if I don't do this, I don't get to live. So it's it, it's, it's everything for me to, to, to get this where it needs to go and share with as many people as possible um, and to share this narrative and to share this story because it's not just mine. It's a bunch of people who live that life, who have those experiences. They may not be as specific, but they exist and they deserve to have a voice too, just like the drug dealer, just like the drug user, just like the pimp, the whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is that you are, that you subscribe to, you know what I mean? Like everybody should be able to, to tell a story and we haven't been allowed to do that. And that's an issue, you see what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just curious, man, because you know, in in the creative space, like the the big goal of a lot of creatives is is to just be able to usually live off whatever their particular uh, particular art form is. Um, you know, I, I I assume many ascribe to be highly successful in it. And hearing you talk about your art background, man, it sounds like you were you were moving in a pretty good direction of being like like a a, a really top visual fine 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 arts artist so i'm just curious like what made you step away from that world and, and go into music you know like what was kind of the, the thought process there and then two um can you walk me through the emotions and the the, the mind state you kind of had at that time right like like making the decisions to jump from this thing where i'm, I'm seeing momentum I'm, I'm making the name right it, it's allowing me to build out but you know there's this other thing that I want to jump into the easy answer to be honest with you is like i just loved i love music i love music way more than anything else in the world to be honest with you uh i ended up probably in the art space because it was uh 
incentivized. Like I, I tell people this all the time. I don't know if I was like destined to be some great visual artist or just people kept telling me to do it. And so like when you a kid, we all draw. Y'all drew when y'all was kids. I don't know one person that didn't draw when they was a kid. Yeah. I think yeah. some people just get told, hey, you should keep doing this or you should not. Hey, you suck. But we all kind of suck. It's just like it's kid drawings. You know what I mean? Ain't no kid ever drew a Picasso. You know what I mean? Like, so it's just like you just keep drawing. And so you go through school and everybody's like, you're going to be an artist. You're going to be a great artist. And I think I realized one day that most of that had been projected onto me. It sucks to find it out in your late 20s, but you find it out. You see what I'm saying? And so for me, I went to school for that. You know what I mean? Like I that was and I, and for me, to be honest with you, I went to school for art, did really, really well, and then transferred to Maryland uh, so I could be closer to New York. And I had low self-worth, low self-esteem. So I believed I couldn't get into school in New York. So I didn't even apply. I ended up applying to schools in Maryland. I was like, it's two hours away or whatever. I'm going to take my time and like drive up to New York and work on music and try to get my demos to people and my mixtapes to people. And like, maybe I'll get signed. That never happened. Right. I never even got to New York. I was so bogged down working and going to school and dealing with like substance abuse and women and all this other stuff that I just didn't do nothing. I got kicked out of school, came back to Memphis and locked in on visual art while making music at the same time. Cause like, you know, my mom was paying, you know, we struggling to be in school. I was barely in school every semester, uh, always had some, some money, you know, uh, left over or whatever, like in terms of like, I owe some money every semester and had to figure it out every single semester. And so at a certain point it was about living up to what my mom and my grandmother and people had wanted for me. None of my niggas went to college. None of them. I'm the only cousin male cousin that went to college my dad didn't go to college my uncles didn't go to college so it was a lot being kind of put on me to to do that you know what i mean and so i did it and i take it seriously like i take everything else seriously and i was good i'm great or whatever and so you know i was doing very very well and i'm very ambitious too so i was like yo i really want to do this i can do this i want to be in the moment and I felt that way for a while and like was succeeding and selling work. My my work that I was selling was uh, financing the music. Like I was able to buy my first live setup or speakers or microphones or any of that off of painting money. You see what I'm saying? So that was my day job. The fact that I was a visual artist and then I'm doing city commissions and stuff. So I'm able to like take 10K, buy this piece of equipment and that piece of equipment to record music. But everybody who knew me knew I cared more about the music than anything in the world. It just was so much harder to do and it cost a lot of money, right? And then I started getting into photography. So now at this point, it's straight numbers, right? So, and it's probably bad to tell people, but like film, I'm a film, I do a lot of film photography stuff. A lot of it's about gentrification and displacement in black neighborhoods in the city, specifically in the South and stuff, but in Memphis. Um, and that's what I got popular for, like more popular for and got a lot more money for, right? So I buy a roll of film, roll of film, what, $5 or something like that, $6 if b and is high, right? I take, it's 36 exposures. I take 36 photos. If I get 10 this good, let's say I get 20 this good, it's a good night. I, I get 20 good photos of what I'm documenting. And then uh, let's say five of them sell and they sell for $6,000 a pop. Mm. I'm straight. And I got a little bit to live, a little bit to invest in my music. And I always invested way more in my music than I did in my living. I didn't give a damn about how I was living. I was living foul, you know what I mean? But everything was going to the music because people really knew, the people who knew me knew that's what I care about more than anything. And people would pressure me sometimes to be like, why do you, why are you doing so many things? Why do you da 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 Because they seeing what they deem as a successful art career, when in reality, I didn't want to do like, I seen what you got to do to get where you need to go in the visual art world. And I ain't want to do that shit. Like getting, getting plucked in the way that they can get plucked, being made and commodified and taken advantage of in a way that they can get taken advantage of, which I've also experienced. I've been fucked in music, right? I've been fucked in, in music multiple times, but I kept going. Every time I got fucked in the visual art world, 
it left a stain on me that made me just not care as much. And I looked at that and I said, if I'll fight through fire, flame and everything in the world to keep sharing music with people, right? No matter the cost, no matter whatever, whatever, but I won't do that over here. Maybe this is what I really care about. Mm. You know what I mean? Because when you're young, you got so many people projecting on you. You don't really know what you want to be. You just know what you're good at. And so you try everything under the sun because I was good at a lot. So I'm trying a bunch of different things. But at the end of the day, nothing made me happier. Nothing made me more excited. I, I Nothing made me get out of bed more than music. And at a point, again, in that transition point, I go, I need to shave away every single thing that ain't really what I want to be doing or that's not bringing me the fulfillment and joy that I need as a human being. So I stop, you know, showing uh, visual art. Uh, I still was selling some stuff here or there to specific collectors that were people I knew, uh, but I really stopped showing. I left the nonprofit world because that world is shysty. Uh, and I really couldn't deal with that no more. I was just like, ah, I'm, I'm out of here. I left the nonprofit world, left the gallery that I was with, that I worked seven years to bring into fruition. I left there. I stopped doing city commissions. Uh, I put everything to the side. Everything. If you was funny in my life, I put you over there. And I said, I'm moving in this direction because I really felt like I was asking so much of the universe and so much of this music that I couldn't not give my all to it. You see what I'm saying? And in reality, all the years prior, I had been given 40% here, 30% here, 20% there, and I was doing okay. But the goals and the dreams that I had for what I wanted to do musically required 100%. And when I sat back and said, nigga, you ain't never actually gave 100% to music. Do it. See what happens. You've been splitting your time and your energy with all these different things for 10 years. You've been artist, filmmaker, this, that, and the multidisciplinary, blah, 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 community leader, act activist, uh, arts advocate, blah, 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 all these things. Well, like, put all that on the back burner and give your, you give your music 10 years. Give you, and let's start it. And so, like, when I tell people 2023 was the first year of my life where every single day I woke up, all I did was focus on music, nothing else. My music and my my health and my growth as a human being and a man, you know what I mean? But outside of that, it was music. And I didn't see what changes have transpired in that little amount of time. And I go, damn, if I would have been doing this, da da da. but it wasn't for me to do back then. I had to learn a bunch. I had to like go through the fire. I'm one of those people, I don't, I want to be a person who just like has all the right things and knows what to do at the right time. But I've so far been a person that has to like be the first through the door. And when you're the first through the door, you might get booked. You know what I mean? You get hitting your jaw, somebody shoots you, something, you, know I mean? you bust through the door and you get fucked over and then you learn and then you come back and then you peek through the door. This time, all right, now it's a good time to go. Yeah. That's that's who I am. And so for me, when, when we talk about age, like I'm 32 years old, I ain't got no shame in that. I needed all that time. I, I, I had a label meeting uh, last year where I told I told the exec, I said, you wouldn't have want to sign me at 21. So thank God that I'm what I am now, because this nigga is completely different than that nigga. You know what I mean? And for my own personal understanding and growth, I wouldn't have wanted to get signed back then. This man here today is prepared for everything that he's trying to manifest and to bring into fruition. That young nigga was not. And he lived the life of a nigga that was not. Everything that I bumped up against was not that. So when you say like, what what was the thing? It's really love. It's really love. And it sounds cliche, but I love this music shit. Like I don't know many people who love this music shit. Like how I'm I'm obsessive about this music shit. I love I love music. That's my nigga. You know what I mean? Like we like this with ours. And so anybody who know me, I don't talk about nothing else. I talk about the arts. But when we get to talking about that music, though, and not necessarily my music, I don't really even talk about my music. I'm talking about just music, the history of music. I'm obsessed. I love it. It's the greatest thing that we've done. It's one of the greatest things that we've done. But I also love film. And eventually I want to get in that, too, as you know, as we see from the video. But that's all through the lens of music. 
I got introduced to film through the lens of music. When I was younger, my uh, my cousin, y'all seen Goodfellas, we all seen Goodfellas. But you remember that soundtrack to Goodfellas? Yeah. How like potent it was? Mm -hmm. That's why I was like, yo, you get to do this? And then I started to dig into that. So music is, is my life. At this stage in my life and who I am at 32 years old, music means more to me than anything. I get, I, you know, it means more to me than anything. I, I love it. it. It brings me to perform, to share it, to create something dope, to like collaborate with people, to like refashion things, to sit there in the studio and like go through samples and hear this thing and channel this energy or hear this way you can flip this and like put these, it's, it's, it's amazing. Amazing. So I, I tell niggas all the time, people I know, they be like, man, I'm thinking about getting the music. I'm like, nigga, you sure? This shit'll take, it, it'll take your whole, it's obsessive. It's beautiful. You know what I mean? It's it's uh enticing, you know what I mean? But it's either I'm crazy or I'm put here to do this. And so I choose to believe that I'm put here to do this. You know what I mean? Mm. Oh, battery. Don't worry about Don't that. Worry about that. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it, it'll get on a good little top, a good little line. So yeah. Now that's uh that I mean, that's really a I don't know, man. Like everything you said was beautiful, bro. Like I, it's good to hear, you know, an artist who loves it and legitimately trying to figure it out, understands the business behind it and all that as well, and wants to make that work. But again, at the end of the day, you love it, right? Because there's so yeah. many people who don't who don't love it and they're just playing the game. One for money, cool. And then there's other ones who just feel like they're cosplaying to me. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. They like the the fame or the things associated with it, or they like the idea of an artist, but they don't really truly study it and understand like so it's like, are you an artist beyond just wanting to put something out and get people to like what you do? Like cause you don't know too much about the arts beyond your own output. You get what I mean? And so hearing you talk about that obsessiveness beyond your own music, right? Like that that's what I love to hear, which goes back to all the things that you talk about referencing over and over again. The greatest artists that we talk about are always referencing some other form of art. For sure. Yeah. It's it's history, it's research. Like, you know, I and like when I, I remember I got in trouble in college. I said, uh, I said it's artists, it is niggas that make art. And yes. niggas were so offended by that. And I get it, I was being an asshole. But at the same time, it's like, nah, that's real. Like, and I think those people, they get into the game, they don't, they don't struggle for 10 years trying to make this shit happen because they go right to where the money is. Yeah. I'm not going to where the money is. I want to make money because it's my life, right? But I'm going to where my soul is and where my heart and my spirit is. And I want you to feel that in the music. I want you to hear it. And, and I, I wouldn't be here. Like I, I tell my management. Anybody we have meetings with, I say, me being right here is a miracle. If y'all knew the ins and outs of my existence in my life and everything that I done been through to keep doing this, when there's been times where it's been like, oh, lost it all. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, this single flopped. Little, little, little. Like, people didn't understand this. Whoop, whoop. Like, booed off state. Whoop, whoop. And just kept going. My first show when I was, can't remember how old I was, maybe 20 or something or whatever. Yeah, niggas walked out a whole half the room walked out because I was performing what I was performing. It was some different shit, but they walked out, walked all through me and everything. Like it was like it was like a weird little setup in there. Niggas was walking in front of me and behind me. I'm sitting there trying to rap. And I remember, man, I was sick. I had invited family. My girl was there. My family, I was sick. And I remember just not speaking. I just remember like going, we went to IHOP and I was sitting there. I ain't eating nothing. I was just sitting there. And I remember going like, I'm finna quit. And what I was like, this, this is too embarrassing. This is too rough. And I remember I woke up the next day and was like, this will never happen to me again. I'm finna take control of how I do this. And I went and like saved up money for six months and bought my own microphones, my own speakers. And I started doing shows in my garage. And I was like, I'm gonna do it like punk rock niggas. And then I went to the galleries. So it's just like, I love this shit, you know what I mean? Like, and I study this shit and I'm obsessive about it. If I wasn't making music, I'd probably be like a history professor or something. And then like with the visual art stuff, it was very easy for me to, to make the type of art I was making because it's so research-based. A lot of it is about, uh, a lot of it has been about, you know, black circumstances, black life in the South and in Memphis. So it's research-based. 
So I'm spending all this time researching and then making the piece based in that research. And so with the music, it's kind of the same thing. I just love the music more. So I'm sitting here diving into blues, diving into these early art forms and putting together and fashioning what this is and channeling that spirit and that energy that was present, you know, in that, in that stuff. You know what I mean? And I'm going to keep doing that. Like, you know, we got this album again. I said that album was done in, in 2022 and, you know, we're currently mixing it and trying to get the support behind it and like talking to people and meeting people and like they just taking me around, you know, introducing me to folks or whatever. But I'm six records into another project or whatever. Uh, that's pulling from another energy. You know what I mean? And I know what I want to do. I've known what I want to do for years. I just don't know how it looked like. Like, I don't know how to get there or whatever. But like, that's why I finally, thank God, I got a team around me that like, I've never had a team, never had a team. All this time, I never had a team. I had a manager for like six months before I like blew up the Don Lifted shit or whatever, which was my last name. My last name was Don Lifted. Um, but I, I blew it up or whatever. And, and so I never really got to experience what it felt like to have support. I was always carrying this thing up a hill by myself, you know what I mean, with the people that people always thought, especially back home, people thought I was way more like, successful and popping than I was and it was like bro I ain't got no money all my money go to music you know what I mean but because I had a little bit more than other people especially coming from the environment that we coming from that's enough that's enough it's enough to get you popped too which is a whole nother thing you know what I mean so mm -hmm. it's always been a treacherous road to like navigate just being able to live you know what I mean just being able to like share your stuff you know it's, it's really difficult uh, because the bar is so low in terms of like what being owned looks like when you come from where we from. Just having some visibility is you own. It was like, bro, I was famous in town and was broke. And then, you know, got a little whatever, whatever, and then went broke again, like purposely went broke, pouring my, my money into things. And so people don't really always know what the road to like, figuring your dreams out looks like or whatever. And that's why like, I appreciate like platforms like this one because it, it gives a transparent like look for like artists to kind of detail their stories and like what choices they made and what mistakes they made and how they figured these things out. And so it's like, for me, like that's the stuff that I look at to keep going. Like, you know, now again, I got a team now, but back then I was in Memphis. There's no infrastructure, no support, no team, no OGs, no nothing. And so your belief has to come purely from within which ain't always sustainable. So you get on these apps and you get on YouTube and you look at the content and these interviews of the artists that are doing things you would like to do and you pull motivation and inspiration from them folks. So to, you know, even be, you know, on this platform is like, it's it's very, you know, you know, circular for me. You know what I mean? It's like very full circle because there's been times where I've been, you know, locked on the clips where a nigga is talking about his journey and I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm at that place. Okay. Okay, I'm not the only one that felt this. Okay. And the other platforms, you know what I mean? We ain't gonna shout them out, but like, you know what I mean? Other platforms where you, you know, where you hop on there and this nigga's talking about their journey. It's like, it's been beautiful watching like Vince Staples go around and talk about how hard it was to get that show off the ground and what his career has been like. That is more akin to me than somebody being plucked out of obscurity because they had potential and given a shot. Like, that ain't never been my story. I never, I never, I had people believing in me, but I had, I, it wasn't necessarily people that could always do something. You know what I mean? It'd be one thing that led to a thing, 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 led to a thing. And then you could take advantage of that opportunity. You know, it just might be somebody like, this dude is dope. But it wasn't like, hey, come here, come with me and da da da. Like, I'm just getting to that space where where I made something that's strong enough and 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 locked in enough for anybody to even invest the time and energy into me in a way that's non-exploitable, you know what I mean? So, you know, definitely, definitely shout out to y'all for like providing that type of platform for niggas to like go through and talk about the stuff that we talking about, you know what I mean? So, yeah. For sure, man. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man, and appreciate you having you on, man. I definitely think your story and so much of what you laid out here is gonna help like just not only artists, but just people in general who are actually like struggling to achieve a dream in general, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, and I know as you continue to build and get more visibility for people to be able to come back to this, 
you know, and contrast where you are versus everything you were saying and talking about right now, going back into the history is going to be beautiful, man. So, yeah, appreciate having you on once again, man. Uh, yo, everybody, this is Lawrence Matthews. This is yet another episode of No Labels Necessaries. I'm Brian Manshawn. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.